Thank you, Helen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to uh, talk about analyzing Firefox browser extensions for security vulnerabilities. This is joint work with uh, Professor Sam King, P. Madhusudan, and Mary Ann Winslet from University of Illinois. Web browsers have become the de facto pl uh, platform for web computations. And uh, uh, Firefox is one of the most popular web browsers today, next only to Internet Explorer. It, uh, it has about 25% of the market share. And browser extensions contribute a lot for Firefox's uh, popularity. There are around 150 million extensions in use today. And these extensions provide a variety of functionality, right from changing the look and feel of the website to providing complex uh, functionality like adding security to the browser's content, blocking ads like the Adblock Plus pro extension. Um, no script extension is very popular. It blocks all, uh, all kinds of script on the page. Um, then there are other extensions which, uh, which actually provide web development environments like Firebug and download managers. Um, and there are several other uses of these extensions. Oh, looking at Firefox's popularity, even Chrome and Safari have, uh, in, have introduced uh, browser extensions, uh, support for browser extensions. Anyone can write and upload an extension. If a new add-on is submitted to the new extension or add-on is submitted to the uh, Firefox uh, add-ons web page, then it is first subject to an editor review process. The editor review process looks for uh, certain uh, errors in the extensions, like whether it's polluting the namespace of the browser or it's uh, degrading the performance of the browser. It also has simple checks whether uh, to check if some remote JavaScript is being executed by the browser or some binary is being into, uh, is in the browser is in the extension. Uh, the editor review process also has certain simple uh, uh, grep or searches for vulnerable keywords, but we'll see later that this produces a lot of false positives. Um, if the reviews, uh, if the uh, extension passes the review, then it is uh, made public. Ideally, one would think that all the extensions and all the updates to the extensions would pass through this uh, editor review process, but that's not true. If an extension is popular, it is moved to a trusted category, and uh, any update to the trusted extension is directly made public. So you can see that this could also introduce bugs in the extensions. Uh, to further enhance this editor review process, we developed this tool called VEX, which is a static analysis tool uh, to analyze the web extensions for vulnerabilities. These vulnerabilities are characterized in our tool as explicit information flows. And uh, what VEX does, given a set of extensions, it uh, checks these extensions for the presence of ex uh, certain explicit information flows and outputs only those extensions which it thinks has those particular flows. The, ma uh, the extension vetter then has to go and uh, manually analyze these extensions to check if the uh, uh, extensions are attackable or not. To understand the, ex uh, the vulnerable flows in detail, we have to first understand the extension architecture. Uh, the extensions have mainly two components. One component enhances the user interface of the browser. It adds new, uh, new toolbars, buttons, widgets, and so on to the browser's Chrome. And the functionality to this, uh, these objects is provided, is written in JavaScript. So uh, the extension JavaScript has this, runs at the same privilege level as the browser. And uh, uh, the Firefox API, uh, Firefox also provides special API called the XPCOM components, uh, which allow the extension JavaScript to access uh, different uh, uh, objects like the file system, network, and also several, a uh, uh, lot of data available to the browser like the bookmarks. In com comparison, if there is some, some JavaScript running in a web page, in the content web page, then it does not have access to any of these components. It only runs at uh, restricted privileges. 
So in summary, there are two privileges, privilege levels in the browser uh, for JavaScript. One is the content con privilege level or the content context, and the other one is the Chrome context. Attacks could occur if a paid JavaScript is executed somehow uh, in the Chrome context. And since extensions uh, um, provide a bridge between the Chrome and the content context, um, they are, uh, the, the external content JavaScript can use the extensions to uh, attack the browser and the computer. So our threat model is that we trust the uh, extension devel developer to build benign extensions. Um, the extension developer need not introduce vulnerabilities in the extension. If he wants to be malicious, he can write, he, since he has root privileges, he can write anything. So uh, our model only uh, considers the developers to be benign. Uh, errors are introduced or vulnerabilities are introduced because of uh, buggy code or poorly designed code. And attacks originate from the content, either uh, malicious pages or malicious RSS feeds or so on. Let's look at a concrete example to understand how these attacks happen. I'm going to show you the Firefox browser. Um, if uh, most of you might have used the RSS feed feature of the Firefox browser, one can subscribe to our different kinds of RSS feeds, uh, like the news RSS feeds and so on. The vulnerability I'm going to show today is on an RSS feed reader. RSS feed readers present the RSS feeds in a visually pleasing manner. Uh, so uh, you can, you not, if you notice here, they have subscribed to three different RSS feeds. The first one is a benign RSS feed. It uh, gets some news. The second one is, uh, uh, is an RSS feed where I have introduced a script in its name. So I have introduced an alert, uh, alert in its name. And this is also benign, just that it, uh, it shows that we can um, um, there's some uh, script, in the page, script in the name. The third RSS feed contains script, which actually displays the contents of the root directory. So you can't see this completely, but I'm accessing the Mozilla's uh, component uh, file API to, uh, to access the contents of the root. Notice that when I click on these extensions, when I cl click on these RSS feeds, the alert is not displayed. But uh, look what happens if I use this, an RSS feed reader named Fizzle. When the first uh, RSS feed is opened, displayed on the page, uh, the alert is, ex uh, the script is executed and alert is generated. And uh, when the second uh, RSS feed is opened, the, all the contents of my root directory are displayed. This is a very simple attack, but uh, the attacks could be much more severe than this. So let's analyze how the attack actually happened. First, there was a flow from the RSS feed, the content, to the Firefox bookmarks. Once the RSS feeds were stored in the bookmarks, um, there was a flow from the bookmarks to the fizzle page. So when the content was displayed on the fizzle page, uh, by assigning the, uh, the value to an inner HTML object of the page, of an element of a page, uh, the attack happened. So in VEX, we characterize this kind of attack as an explicit information flow uh, from, the, uh, from the bookmarks, from the RSS feeds, to the inner HTML property of the page. Uh, other kinds of flows can also be characterized as an explicit information flows. Uh, an example would be accessing the content page. So in the extension, the content can be accessed using this window.content.document uh, object. And uh, uh, the extension can access this and uh, execute it in, uh, or run it in an evaluation context. So uh, Firefox provides this uh, eval uh, function wherein, which takes a string and executes it in the uh, and, and executes it. So if the eval is present in the extension, any script obtained from the web page would have uh, would be uh, executed in the Chrome context. Um, 
so there are two, two different flows here. One is uh, flow from content page to eval, and the other one is from content page to the inner HTML object, as we've seen already. Apart from these uh, information flows, we've also noticed that certain unsafe programming practices can also be uh, modeled as explicit information flows. So one example is the usage of eval and sandbox function. Eval and sandbox allows uh, the Firefox extension to execute JavaScript in a restricted sandbox content, sand, sandbox area. Here we see uh, the variable x is the result of running an untrusted script in, the, in, in a sandbox. Uh, for the use, for uh, using this return value safely, we have to resort to using non-standard con constructs. So uh, uh, this, this uh, usage of x would be safe only if it is used in triple equal to comparisons, versus if it's used in uh, if if it's used in double equal to comparisons, then uh, it it could be it could be potentially um, attackable in the sense that uh, the untrusted script could have modified this value of function. And so when x dot value of function is called in this comparison, uh, an attack uh, could have happened. So this is an explicit information flow where the source is the usage of eval and sandbox, and the sync is any uh, statement where a double equal to comparison is made. Another example of uh, unsafe flow, unsafe uh, pro programming practice, is the usage of wrap chase object property. So uh, in Firefox, the content JavaScript and the Chrome job JavaScript access the same DOM objects. So uh, to protect Chrome JavaScript from changes in the DOM, uh, DOM objects by the content script, Firefox provides a wrapper around it. Uh, so any Chrome JavaScript would have would access only the native JavaScript and not the modified JavaScript. Uh, but it also provides this wrap.js object property, wherein when uh, when the Chrome JavaScript uses this wrap.js object property, it would access the modified DOM versus the native DOM. So attacks could happen when uh, the content JavaScript dynamically modifies a DOM object. Uh, for example, a get element by ID method on the page, and uh, the Firefox extension accesses this wrap.js object property and runs this particular method. Again, the, uh, this can be characterized as explicit information flow, where the source is an access to wrap.js object property, and the sync is any place uh, where uh, any method call which is called on that property, called on that object. As you've seen, uh, since all the different kinds of vulnerable, vulnerabilities can be uh, represented in the form of flows between different objects, VEX static analysis computes the precise flows between various objects in the, in the JavaScript program. Our analysis is context sensitive, field sensitive, and flow sensitive, and it is slightly non-standard in the sense that it is not inherently terminating we have to bound the number of iterations of the analysis. All these design choices were made uh, to ensure that we get a, a, as less number of false positives as possible. And uh, the analysis is also unsound and uncom incomplete. Uh, the details for, for further details on this, please refer to the paper. So to understand the motivation, some motivation for why, why we have these design choices, I'm showing you an example uh, code. This is a simplified version of the Fizzle extension. You don't have to understand any of this code. Just notice that uh, the code uses a lot of objects and a lot of methods, and the, uh, it is spread across different JavaScript files. Uh, the source of the RSS feed is uh, here, where uh, the components API is accessed and the RSS feed uh, service is accessed. Uh, the sync is where the content is attached to the inner HTML of a page element. What VEX has to do is to uh, somehow find out that there is a dependency of, uh, so there is a flow from this source to this particular sync. That is, there is uh, this object is dependent on, the, on this object. 
So let us look at the analysis in detail. Uh, what VEX does is for every object and method of the JavaScript program, it creates an abstract heap data structure. So uh, the nodes in this data structure are uh, objects and properties and methods. And the uh, edges in this uh, data structure represent the um, object properties. So for example, uh, the bookmarks method is represented by node n1. And the load function of the bookmarks method is represented as node n3. For every node, we cap keep track of the uh, flows into that object or property. So uh, here, the node n4 represents the RSS feed access. And uh, it, dip it, it accesses um, the components, classes, and interfaces, and RSS uh, RDF service. All these uh, objects flow into this um, node n4. So the VEX analysis um, iterates over each program statement and uh, modifies the heap according to the uh, abstract semantics which are provided in the paper. The analysis terminates when the fixed point is reached or a bound is reached. So once we have, uh, uh, once, once it terminates, we have the set of dependencies for each node in the program. Uh, to validate our analysis, we downloaded about 2,500 extensions from the add-ons web page. Uh, we, got, we got this from different extension categories and from the set of uh, most popular extensions. Uh, we found that VEX takes only 15 and a half seconds to analyze each extension on an average. Uh, so the, uh, these are the results for uh, the different kinds of flow patterns I've, uh, I've already shown. Uh, the we, we tested for three kinds of flow patterns. One is from content document to eval. The other one is from content document to inner HTML. And the other one is from bookmarks to inner HTML. A simple search for keywords like uh, uh, eval or inner HTML uh, showed that there were several extensions which have those uh, keywords. And this is what uh, Firefox editor's validation tool would show. Uh, VEX alerts, uh, VEX <coughs> VEX significantly decreases the number of extensions uh, which are shown to be vulnerable. That is, it checks for the, uh, the presence of certain flows, uh, for the presence of these flows, and shows that only so, uh, some extensions have these flows. Of, these, uh, uh, of the alerts generated by VEX, we found that uh, from manual analysis, six extensions were actually attackable. Uh, the first uh, two extensions were two versions of the Wikipedia toolbar, and uh, they had a flow from content document to eval. Uh, Wikipedia do uh, toolbar uh, helps Wikipedia editors and gives uh, shortcuts to the Wikipedia editors. Uh, this was an entirely new vulnerability, which we found through VEX. We, uh, we reported th this as a CVE vulnerability and also reported this to the extension author. Uh, who subsequently corrected his extension. The other four attacks were on RSS feed readers, uh, flow, which are flows from bookmarks to inner HTML object. Uh, Beatnik version 1.2 and Fizzles 0.5 and 0.5.1 were already known vulnerabilities. Uh, in case of Fizzle, the extension author had, uh, sanit has intro had introduced sanitization code in the extension to correct these previous vulnerabilities. But we found that uh, the next version of Fizzle was also vulnerable for, uh, for these kinds of attacks. So we found that the sanitization was not enough in this case. Uh, the rest of the extensions were uh, not attackable. Uh, and this is our analysis of not, uh, why these extensions are not attackable. The first set of extensions uh, had uh, uh, they, they were taking the content from a trusted page, uh, like Facebook or Twitter and so on. So uh, these are in fact attackable. These extensions are in fact attackable if uh, the content page is somehow attacked or uh, somehow spoofed. Um, the other extensions were not attackable because we found that uh, some extensions uh, code was properly sanitized. Um, and we could not attack the sanitization function. Uh, some extensions had sinks in non-Chrome context. And uh, some extensions 
did not have the flows and these were, uh, these, uh, these were reported because of the inherent incompleteness of our static analysis. Uh, some extensions were too complex to be analyzed manually, so uh, we do not know whether they, have, uh, they can be attacked or not. Uh, Let us look at the results for uh, the flows and uns uh, the unsafe programming practices practice flows. Uh, we looked for uh, two unsafe programming practices, one from evalence sandbox to uh, double equal to and the other from uh, method call, uh, RAPJS objects to method calls on it. Uh, simple grep showed that a lot of extensions were vulnerable. Uh, in case of evalence sandbox flows, VEX found only three extensions which had uh, flows from eval and uh, sandbox to double equal to, which need to be corrected. And uh, surprisingly, we found a lot of extensions which had flows from RAPJS object to method call on RAPJS object. Uh, we looked at some of these extensions manually and uh, found that these uh, flows actually exist. Uh, but for some of the extensions, the flows were from safe objects, like objects created by the extension or the browser Chrome. To, uh, to the method call on RAPJS object, and these uh, cannot be attack attacked. But some of the extensions had flows from content to uh, a method call, so those have to be corrected uh, for the extension uh, if the extension needs to be safe. <coughs> In summary, uh, we developed a tool called VEX, uh, which is a, uh, which uses static analysis techniques. Uh, it is flow sensitive and context sensitive analysis for ex explicit information flows. Uh, one of our main uh, contribution or thesis of the paper is that all the uh, vulnerabilities, all extension vulnerabilities, or most of them, can be uh, characterized in the form of explicit information flows, and that's what we leverage in the tool. Uh, we detected three new and three previously unknown vulnerabilities. Uh, we also detected hundreds of instances of unsafe programming practices. Um, in the future, we want to um, perform a comp comprehensive study of uh, uh, known vulnerabilities, known extension vulnerabilities, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, model them as explicit information flows between different sources and sinks. We, in fact, found about uh, 16 more uh, known vulnerabilities and about uh, 13 of them could be uh, characterized as flows. Uh, we are working on introducing them uh, as flows in VEX and uh, testing the extensions. Um, we also want to use a constraint solver for automatically generating the attack vectors. This will reduce the amount of manual work needed and also reduce the false positives from the tool. Further information on the tool and any uh, new results would be uh, displayed in this uh, uh, web page. So that concludes my talk. Shruti, that's a very lovely talk. I'd, I'd like you to, um, Peter Neumann, I'd like you to uh, channel your co-author, Sam King, and step back a little bit. The first, the first part of the question is, um, what are the limitations of your flow analysis and what, what are you not able to detect? But the broader question is, we have operating systems we have, can't trust, we have browsers we can't trust, we have clients and servers we can't trust, we have programming languages that are inherently unsound, uh, we have uh, tools that are fundamentally <laughs> inadequate. Uh, so the question is, in, in the broader picture, uh, what, uh, where, where can this work go and, and what do we need to do to uh, get out of this uh, rather ugly box that uh, is presented by the overall picture? Okay. Uh, first up, the limitations. Um, the limitations, there are some limitations of static analysis. Um, we have, uh, they, they have false positives um, and also there are some limitations of uh, uh, analyzing the programming language like JavaScript itself in the sense that they have dynamic features like eval uh, and uh, different kinds of dynamic features which cannot be analyzed statically. So a tool like this um, can be used as a bug finding tool but not, not, a, not a way to show that okay there are no, no errors or no, no extensions which are 
uh, not vulnerable if, if it passes through this tool, right? Uh, as for uh, your second question, I mean, I guess I'm not in a position to say that, okay, nobody should use JavaScript, we should use safe languages uh, or something like that, but I guess giving more thought into uh, building languages which are analyzable uh, would uh, take us a long way in solving this problem. Thank you for a great talk. Um, one thing that struck me when you showed your first example of the vulnerability is that there isn't an inherent evilness in having a flow from a, a user-produced element to something that goes in and so on. What I find is wrong is this uh, age-old um, class of, of, of bugs uh, coming from people being incompetent at quoting. So it's just that if you get something that contains angle brackets, you want it to flow through your thing and come out as angle brackets, not something that gets interpreted as the meta meaning of the angle brackets. Now, is this something that you can reliably, statically analyze, whether someone does the quoting properly? I would consider that to be more important than just following the flow of the stuff. I agree. Uh, so, um, so the, you can analyze that to a certain extent. Uh, using, um, you know, constraint solvers. There was a paper in Oakland which tried to analyze sanitization routines and understand uh, what kind of the, the uh, group of, or what kind of uh, sanitization it does and whether there are some outliers which, which don't, which are not detected by the sanitization routine. Um, but it's a tough problem, I agree. Um, it, did I answer your question? Or? Okay. Hi, I'm Jinpeng from uh, Florida International University. Uh, so um, in your uh, talk, which is uh, great, and uh, uh, you mentioned that you try to uh, minimize the false uh, positives right, in your results. And then, um, but you um, didn't uh, uh, mention uh, about uh, false negatives. Uh, so for example, on slide 18, you showed uh, uh, numbers um, mm -hmm. and uh, and so um, my question is uh, two questions. One is the um, do you have the ground truth uh, in terms of these uh, uh, these uh, popular extensions? So which which ones uh, are actually malicious? Which ones are benign? So do you have ground truth? And the second one, is it possible that your analysis actually miss some of the bad extensions? Thank you. So I do mention that the tool is unsound. We do miss some bad uh, bad extensions. Uh, one uh, basic example would be if the extension uses eval and we can't determine the st uh, statically what string goes into that eval. So in that case, we would definitely miss flows, right? Um, uh, what was your other question? Um, so the ground truth. Ground truth about... Uh, about these uh, extensions. So it's, it's really difficult to know that. So over the summer, I had uh, like... I had two undergrads working with me, uh, looking for uh, looking at popular extensions in different categories and trying to attack them. But we found that it is really difficult to create attack, just create a fuzzing tool like thing to attack these extensions. Every extension takes different kinds of inputs, and it's uh, it's difficult to say whether they are attackable or not. And that's why there's a need for some kind of tool which would tell us, okay, there's some kind of flow in this extension. You need to look at focus on this particular flow and see if it is attackable or not. Okay, so you can use your tool actually to provide the first version of this uh, one tool, right? Yeah, we, we didn't, uh, I mean, we didn't find popular extensions which were, uh, which were attackable. Okay, thank Through you. Uh, Colin Jackson from Carnegie Mellon University. So could you go to the slide where you, you showed some uh, not attackable uh, extensions? Yeah, so I'm wondering how many of those sources that were a trusted website were being loaded over non-HTTPS connections, and could those uh, be used by an active network attacker to install arbitrary code on your machine? Uh, I don't remember the numbers offhand, but sure, they could have they, they could have been several which are not on non not on HTTPS, and they could be attacked. 
Uh, it's, it seems like you may be seriously underselling the work. You've actually found quite a few more vulnerabilities than you've indicated in this table. Um, and I'm wondering whether you think it should ever be allowed for an extension to load content over the network without HTTPS and then eval it. Uh, yeah, so the, the rationale for having only these uh, few attacks is uh, real attacks is because we could actually attack them and I, we didn't try attacking the rest of the extensions. Um, sure, I mean, there could be a rule which says that only HTTPS pages could be uh, accessed by the extension, but I guess it becomes too restrictive in some sense because you, you would like to allow extensions to modify the page content and be very generic in, in some sense. Well, it's fine for them to modify the page content, but should they be allowed to eval it with sure. arbitrary code they privileges should, on my machine? I don't think that's ever yeah, a safe they, thing they to do. They shouldn't be allowed to use eval at all. And they should, uh, even if they're, uh, they should use eval and sandbox, and even that should be used properly. All right, thanks. Okay, while the speaker sets up the next talk, I'll ask the last question. Okay. So have you, uh, Shruti, have you considered uh, inline monitor-based approaches, uh, such as browser shoot, uh, where you could, you know, which may address a lot of the limitations of the static analysis? Uh, so the motivation for this, uh, uh, this kind of work was to see, was to help the extension editors analyze a bunch of extensions. As you've seen, there are uh, millions of extensions and it is very difficult to manually analyze them. So uh, um, we, uh, and, and this was a proof of con concept tool that even static analysis can be used to find bugs.